I, uh, I love when my class takes notes because I know you're double learning. You know what? That's okay. You pay attention good. You don't need to. Ah, hallelujah. Oh, Lord, bless, anoint the word. Lord, tonight, just fill us. So we're looking at one of the most exciting books in the Old Testament. It's, got, it's a love story. It's a kind of like a mystery novel. It's kind of a, uh, a action, adventure. Uh, it's history. Uh, this book has a little bit of everything. And it's quite a tale to be told. And sometimes, when I, the more I look into this book, the more I wonder, well, Lord, okay. So you got a book in the Bible here, Lord, and, and you don't even let the book say your name. The, God is not mentioned in this book. But the book is about a Jewish orphan girl that was beautiful and courageous. And a, a, an orphan girl, girl that is beautiful and courageous. And God uses her to save God's people from ex, extermination. Uh, the, without Esther, um, you know, that's what was, that was the plan. But even though God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, God is all about the book of Esther. You see, the book of Esther is about the sovereignty of God. So as we look through the book of Esther, you're going to see that God is working behind the scenes the whole time. The whole time. And, and there's so many different fragments of this book that we're going to look at. Tonight we're doing an overview. There's no known author to this book, by the way. We have no known author. Actually, there's no way of determining exactly when this book was written. It's a, it's a mystery book. But yet, it's filled with the sovereignty of God. So the author is unknown. The date of the book is unknown. Now, to look back on how we got to the book of Esther, the, the entire Jewish community had gone so off the tracks. Disobedience, they're, they're rebellious, uh, how they, they just rebelled against the Lord, how they compromised with the Gentiles. All of this caused them to be scattered through Mesopotamia, and which caused them to be vulnerable, the Jewish people. Uh, rebellion against God eventually resulted in d divine judgment and captivity of foreign lands. So they, the Jewish people had just compromised uh, they've rebelled. They scattered amongst the Gentile people. They were just having a free fall, doing as they pleased. And th what this, this caused them to be extremely vulnerable. When they, were when they were unified, serving the Lord, bound together in a, in a single purpose cause, they, they, were, they were unstoppable. But when they were fragmented, and running amok is when they became very vulnerable to be brought into captivity. So here they are, um, taken over by the Babylonians. And after 70 years in exile, God raises up a Gentile king who overthrows Babylon, King Cyrus. And... Um, 
This is the beginning of what's going to change for the Jewish people. So King Cyrus tells the Jewish people, you can go back to Jerusalem if you want and rebuild your city. He lets them go. And so this is a, a, a miracle for the Jewish people. This is a blessing for them that they're going to be turned loose. And in 536 B.C., 50,000 Jews returned to Jerusalem. In 536 B.C., 50,000 Jews went back to Jerusalem. You might think, well, that's a huge amount of people. 50,000 people returned to Jerusalem. And those, those who led the uh, exodus uh, was uh, Zerubbabel, uh, Joshua, the high priest, Ezra and Nehemiah all went to Jerusalem to rebuild, to bring the city back. The majority of the Jews in Persia and Babylon preferred to continue in their ease and luxury life of Persia. The Jews were doing pretty good in, in Persia under Cyrus and Babylon, Babylon was defeated. Uh, they, were, they were having a good time. Uh, some of them have, were found in, in prominent positions in the community. Things are doing great. Why leave? And in the book of Esther, there's no indication that Esther or her uncle had any reason to leave Persia. And uh, so Mordecai, her uncle, uh, didn't wish to return to Jerusalem. And as we go through this book, there's going to be a theme that I want you to hold on to all through this book. And the theme that runs right through this book all the way through to the very end is the providence of God. Now, what does providence mean? It, the providence of God is, is it's the ruling hand of God who... King Cyrus is in, in control. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is in control. Uh, none of these guys are... God is the sovereign ruler. And that's what we're going to see all through this book is you're going to see the providence of God. And it's God's will uh, to lead one who will not be led. You can write that down. It's God's will to lead one who will not be led. Matter of fact, that's why you're all here. It's God's will to lead one who will not be led. Now, King Azeruas, I can never get this guy's name right, uh, he condemned Queen Vesti, or Vesti. And she's the queen, he's the king, and he, he condemns her because she refused to appear at his banquet. Now, the king is throwing a banquet. Not just a banquet. Uh, this is the Mac Daddy of all banquets. Now, King Azarus has been ruling for seven years. And now he wants to show off his kingdom. He has one of the greatest kingdoms there is. And he, he invites all the, the most prominent people in the region. And he invites all the people of Persia. Everyone's invited. And this, this banquet has... It has food and drink, and, and it's so fancy that he even prepared special gold cups, and none of them were the same. Every cup was, had its own personal identity. He was showing off his, his marble and his, his linens and his fabrics and everything, his architecture. He was, this was the Mac Daddy of all banquets. 
And the queen says, I ain't going to that party. The queen had her own thing going on. So he condemns her. And in this condemning of the queen leaves the king without a queen. So he needs a queen. So what he does is he rounds up all the young fair maidens of the land. I mean, gobs of them. Gobs and gobs of fair maidens. And they're brought to the king's palace and they're prepped. They're prepped. The, the prepping is unbelievable. This is a one-year preparation to come before the king. And they got one shot to come before the king and either impress him or not. A whole year's preparation. And the preparation takes place by those who know how to prep these girls. They know what the king likes. They know what the smells the king likes, uh, the perfumes, everything, the jewelry. And, and these, these maidens are dressed up to the hill. And they get to come before the king. They got one shot to impress him. If the king is not impressed, they don't come back. If the king is impressed, he might have them back again to see if he's really impressed. And in this process, we have Esther. And Esther is the cousin of Mordecai, the Jew. And in this pro process, we're going to see that the details are incredible. We don't have time to get into the details, but the details of how Esther is groomed is amazing because there, there's a eunuch that takes special interest in Esther. He's impressed by her. So he brings her into the palace to the, the special, most special room. He gives her the most special attention he grooms her more than the other women. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful story, I'm telling you. I, I think the, the one that I fell in love with mostly in this whole story is the eunuch. He, he's just this cool guy, man. He's a really cool guy. And he had a heart. He had a genuine heart. And I think it's God that put that heart in him for such a time as this. Amazing. But Mordecai, her uncle, or I don't know if you call him an uncle, yeah, but cousin, yeah. Um, he, he finds out that there's two guys plotting to kill the king. So he tells Esther to tell the king that Mordecai found out that these two guys are going to kill the king. So the king puts these two guys in the gallows and kills them and now has special favor towards Mordecai. And um, more, so the king has this, this, this noble He's like the king's best friend. He's like the king's chief of all the, of all the people. He is, uh, his name is ha Haman. And Haman's, he's just, he's just a wicked guy. He's an evil guy. And his history goes back to a time when the Jews killed his father. Uh, and where God commanded the Jews to take ground, and they did, and killed his father, and so he had this bitterness built up in him towards the Jews. He hated the Jews. And Haman, who is the king's, you know, top chief guy, he decides he wants to annihilate the entire Jewish population. He doesn't like the Jews. And so he talks to the king and makes it, you know, the king to understand we need to kill all these Jews and so the king says, okay, let's kill all the Jews. But in the meantime, Esther comes and tells the king, hey, Mordecai, the Jew, found out that these two guys are planning to kill you. 
So Mordecai winds up saving the king's life. Now remember Haman, he hates the Jews. He hates the Jews. So when the king finds out that Mordecai the Jew saved his life, and Mordecai is the one Jew that Haman hated more than anyone else because when, when Haman went through the, the streets of the city and through the marketplace, wherever Haman went, he made the Jews bow down to him. And, and Mordecai wouldn't bow down. He just wouldn't bow down. And uh, Haman even struck him, and he still wouldn't bow down. So he hated Mordecai more than all the other Jews. He just hated Mordecai. And so what he did is he built a gallow. I, I, I can't remember the story, whether it was 50 feet tall, but he, he built these, this giant gallow to hang Mordecai. So Esther tells the king that Mordecai found out that these two guys were going to assassinate him. So he kills the two guys, and then he tells Haman, his number one guy, he says, listen, Haman, somebody saved my life, and I want to reward that person. What do you think I should do? And Haman doesn't know it's Mordecai. So Haman tells the king, hey, you should put him in a fine robe. You should, you know, put royalty all around him, put him on your finest horse, and have someone of of stature, parade him through the, the, the streets to be applauded and praised. And that person that parades him through the streets should, should announce what a wonderful person this is. So the king says to Haman, okay, I need you to do that. His name is Mordecai. <laughs> well, Haman just about has a heart attack. So he has to do it. Because whatever the king says, you do it. So he dresses him up. <laughs> he puts him on the finest horse. He parades him through town. He exalts him. And Haman is... He, who did he parade around? Mordecai. And what is Haman? Mortified. <laughs> He's mortified. He's like, ah, Really? So, so um, let me just see, I covered a lot of this already. So now um, Esther finds out that Haman was going to put her uncle on, on the gallows. So Esther has a plan. And so Esther's plan is that she's going to hold a banquet, a special banquet, a really special banquet. And this banquet is so special that she's only going to invite the king and Haman, the two most special people in the kingdom. And Haman is so excited that the queen invited him to her banquet. And she, he goes back to his, his mansion, and he's bragging to all the people back at his mansion how, yeah, the queen has invited me to her banquet. I'm going to the queen's banquet. And he's just all happy and everything. Well, what the queen does at this banquet is she exposes to the king that Haman was going to annihilate the Jewish people and kill Mordecai on the gallows that he built at his house. So the king commands that Haman be hung on his own gallows. He gives Mordecai Haman's mansion and he exalts ha Mordecai to Haman's position. What a story. But here's the thing. 
Esther wasn't really on board at first. And pretty much the Lord said, listen, you could do this and live, or you could not do this and die. And so Mordecai tells Esther that this is the deal. And he tells Esther that she was brought forth for such a time as this. And that phrase is the most popular phrase in the whole book, that she was brought forth for such a time as this, that that God had prepared her for this moment. And there's no indication that she was really a holy roller. Um, She was a believer, but how strong was her faith? It doesn't really get into that. Uh, We know from Mordecai's behavior, you know, he, he... He fasted and prayed. Uh, He sat in sackcloth over the the burden for the Jewish people. So I I know that Mordecai, uh, I see the connection with Mordecai to the Lord. Esther, I I think she kind of didn't know where it was all going. But she was was in. She was all in. And um, it's amazing how the, the God of all creation, the great I am, how he was moving all the chess pieces around the whole time until he got a checkmate. And it was like, wow, the Lord is in control even when we don't know it. And in your own life, have you ever thought that you were called by the Lord for such a time as this? See, every age has its time. There's no time in history that isn't God-ordained. There's no time in history where the providence of God is not working. There's no time. There has never been an era in all of history where God wasn't on the move. And God is on the move in our generation as well. And where do you fit in? And that's how the book is going to move for us as we walk through it. Is How do we fit into the plan of God and and how can I look at the, the world today and say, I was brought forth for such a time as this. Am I being where I need to be so that the Lord can use me? And, you know, in, in many ways, you say Esther, she was uh, pretty much a deceiver. She deceived the king. Uh, She wasn't honest about things. She withheld things. Uh, You know, you wouldn't say she was like on the up and up. She wasn't the sharpest tool in the church. She she was just a common person, which really goes to show that God can use common people in all your deficiencies, in all your imperfections, in all your, your humanistic ways, if you're willing, God can take you a place to change the world. You know, Billy Graham was on his neighbor's farm and the guy across the fen- over the fence witnessed to him. And if I can get the story right, I think the guy that witnessed to him was Moody. And, and Billy Graham, as a little kid, was like blown away. And so he was willing to let the Lord take him somewhere. And where did the Lord take Billy Graham? Millions of people got saved through his ministry. Just a regular kid. Just a regular, normal kid never thinking that God was going to use him to save the world. And you see story after story like that of how God just uses common people to do uncommon things. It's, it's a, what a blessing it is. What a true blessing it is to be used of God. In whatever capacity he uses you, it doesn't mean that you have to be a pastor or a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't mean that you... You know, you have to go on a, out on the mission field. You, you don't have to save the entire 
the city of whatever. All you have to do is be willing to say, Lord, here I am. I'm right here. And I want to be available. Just use me where I am. However you want to use me. And, you know, you think of Mother Teresa. How she wasn't looking to be famous. She didn't want to come back with awards. She wasn't looking to move up the ladder into some big convent. Having, you know, seniority over all the nuns. Matter of fact, she was uh, rejected by her church at one point. But what ha- she wound up saving the lives of thousands and thousands of people. And she, they say she never really possessed anything. She owned nothing. She just said, here I am, Lord. She followed her burden that God had given her. She followed the passion God had given her. And in your life, there's a world out there. And God wants to use you. He really does. He wants to use you. And I, I know in my own life, I, I, there was a time where you're not going to get me to stand up and t- talk in front of people. And you're certainly not going to get me to read in front of people. That just ain't going to happen. Period. And especially dragging me into a church to make it happen. It was never going to happen. But when God puts a burden in your heart, all you have to do is follow it. And he'll do the rest. He'll do, he'll do all the rest. He, he just let, Here I am, Lord. Whatever you want. And I'll never forget the day I said it to him. Whatever you want. Whatever you want, here I am. And then he does the rest. You just follow. And I encourage you. You're not too old. And you're not too young. And you're, you're not too smart and you're not too dumb. You're not too pretty and you're not too ugly. God doesn't, those aren't qualifications in God's economy. All God needs is availability. That's all he needs. You know, once you say, here I am, Lord, he does all the rest. And uh, this book is going to be an encouragement. And uh, the thing about uh, the book of Esther is uh, it's in the Bible, so we know it's a true story. And if it's a true story, then it can apply to our lives because we're real and they're real. And, and, and the Bible says that all these things were written for our learning. So there's something we're going to learn out of the book of Esther. So next week we're going to get into chapter 1. We're going to break it down piece by piece, part by part. And um, we're going to see what God has for us in the book of Esther. I think it's going to be exciting. Now, a couple announcements. I'm going to let you out early tonight. Um, we are, we've started the children's church. We're refurbishing the entire children's church. The children are going to have a new facility, brand new. And when you walk into the foyer, that's the painting that's going into the children's church. And um, it's going to be, I mean, this is going to be really, really nice for our kids. And, you know, you ever, you ever meet a fussy mom, like a really fussy mom with their kids? Yeah. The fussy mom is going to go in there and go, oh, yeah, I can leave my kids here. Yeah, this will work. It's going to be really nice. So that work started today. And really it started uh, Monday, but uh, we're... We really got into it today. And if you want to be a part of that project, just show up between 8 and 4 o'clock any, any day during the week, and we'll, we'll put a tool in your hand. We'll put a broom in your hand. Uh, we'll put a paintbrush in your hand. Uh, if you don't want to do anything, we'll give you a chair. There are chair people. And uh, we don't care. We just need the support, so... That's going on. Um, Anything else? I think I got everything covered. We studied, did the study. We had worship. I'm wore out. Father, we thank you.
We bless you. We praise you. We are really, Lord, wanting to uh, take everything out of this study that, that is going to be able to apply to our lives so that we have more confidence in stepping out in faith, Lord. So use us, Lord, just like you used all the people in the Bible. Use us too, Lord. We give you glory and honor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think that storm threw our air conditioner clock off.